friends, welcome back to another vlog. It's the weekend, it's Saturday morning. I just got ready for the day. Tom's there, he just came back from running 10K. Can't relate. Um, but we're going over to our friends for brunch. We're gonna have breakfast tacos. And we were gonna play board games, but now everyone's decided we're gonna take a group trip to the DIY store. So one of those two things is happening. We also do need to go to the DIY store. So one of our friends is very passionate DIY dad energy. So she wants to show us around. Um, that's the plan for Saturday and this afternoon I'm just going to rest and knit, obviously, read. Um, this week felt, actually went by really fast, work's been really busy so that helps the days go and like being in meetings more helps the days pass a little faster for me. Um, I don't think I have much else to update you on. I am still reading wellness. Oh, I got my hair cut. That's the other thing. Maybe it's not that noticeable, but it looks nice because it's been blow dried by someone professionally. Just back to a bit shorter, like it was summer of last year, maybe. I just fancied it. I saw, I was like editing a video of myself and I was like, oh, your hair looks really ugly. So I just booked a haircut. Luckily, the hairdresser's at the top of the road. So it wasn't exactly a relaxing experience, but I got it done and that was fine. And then on, last night, we made nachos and did chores. I'm still struggling with my like emotional regulation because of these new meds that I'm on. So I don't know if anyone else has a hard time like transitioning into different parts of your day. Like I find that if I don't intentionally like transition, especially on a Friday night where you've got like the weekend ahead, if I don't intentionally like do the steps I take, like do my meditation breath work, light my candles, make sure the kitchen's tidy, like do all of those steps early enough in my evening, then I start to feel a bit discombobulated. And I was like trying to help a friend with some medical admin and then another friend who's coming on a trip, their trip plans got messed up and I was like doing all this stuff. And then I was like still sitting in my, like on my floor, I had started to tidy up my books and it was like eight o'clock. And then I felt all just a bit muddled. Do you know what I mean? I'm just a stickler for routine. And I didn't start my like 5 p.m put my laptop away and get ready for the day type, get ready for the evening routine. And I felt a bit out of sorts, but I slept all right. But I'm glad it's the weekend at least. And we don't really have any big plans. Like I said, going to our friends down the road for a little bit of brunch. And then tomorrow I've got a coffee date with a new friend. I'm actually being quite social this weekend with people I don't know, which is scary. And in the afternoon I got invited to a yarn club, which is like a, uh, knit and chat or fiber arts and crafts type meetup that happens in the city and it like rotates around the house the like different members houses it's like a group of young like under 30s women i think who all like to knit or crochet so i got invited to that i'm not 100 sure if i'm gonna go yet i do want to go but i feel really anxious because i'm not very good at, i don't think i'm very good at meeting new people and i always not even that I'm not very good at talking to people because I think I can like chit chat in a way that makes other people feel comfortable, but I never feel that, that fulfilled by it. And it also makes me really exhausted really fast. So I was actually chatting to Cisco and Tom about this the other day because we were talking about how we're getting to the age in our life where we, we have now been invited to a few weddings and like more people are getting married and or having kids. And there's like events where you have to socialize with your friends' friends more, like people you don't really know. And me and Tom were talking about how we're probably quite terrible wedding guests because we really hate big groups of people. We really hate small talk and we really hate parties. And then Siska and Tom were kind of like, but you're actually quite good at chatting shit to people, which I do think I am. I think part of that comes from like being a people pleaser, being raised like in a big extended family with a lot of like older, cousins and stuff being raised by a single mum and I spent all like a lot of my childhood summer holidays just like sitting under my mum's desk at her work so I was like always socialized around adults so maybe that helped me um but I don't enjoy it is the thing I'm like, okay at it but I don't really like it so I'm apprehensive to go to the knitting meetup um because of that and it's scary it's scary to do stuff by yourself I think I do have like quite a lot of dependence on Tom, let's be there, because of like going out and about, I mostly don't go out by myself because he takes me in my wheelchair and so there's lots of logistics involved, but anyway, 
if I go, I'll report back for you if you're also a socially anxious person. As we were speaking of knitting, I'm almost done with this balaclava, which let me tell you, was this a wreck? Even with the colander hack, which I put on my Instagram if you saw it, where you run the um, threads through the colander holes, I still just ended up in such a tangle where it was like fucking me off, you know, where, and it just like wasn't even enjoyable and I just want it to be over now. But sorry, can we talk about the amount? I had to like cut and restart so many times because I kept getting in such a tangle. This wasn't like the low key project I was hoping for. And it's also meant that I haven't picked up my jumper knitting because I wanted just to finish this. Um, but I'm almost done which is good. I just need to, I think, probably do one more round of colours. I'm a bit bummed because, I don't know if you can tell, but I messed up the neutral colours because this was the yarn I started with, which I love, and I ordered one of. And then when I realised I wanted to make this balaclava, I ordered a second one on a different order, but I ordered it a slightly different colour and it's a mild with grey in it. And I really wanted this to be beige, but the, the miles come out as like much more Gray. It looks more, even more grey on camera, but more grey than I was hoping for. But I am happy with the colour stripes. I think they look pretty sick. Um, but I'm just not going to be doing three striped colour work again anytime soon because it was kind of a bitch. Um, but anyway, I need to <laughs> weave in these ends. <laughs> then I used to do an applied eye cord around the face, but I have tried it on and it looks pretty cool. So I kind of want to finish that today. So then I can cast on a hat. I'm going to make another Eska hat, which is the rose knitwear pattern, which I showed over Christmas. I made the red and grey one for Tom and I, but Tom basically wears it every day, which is a nice compliment. <laughs> um, but I'm going to do a two-tone green one. I've got the arm for it. I can show you tomorrow to make one for my friend Kev or our friend Kev, because I made his girlfriend, Lila, who's one of my close friends in the city. I made her a bonnet for Christmas and I promised I'd make something for Kev. And so that's what I need to do. And um, we also got yarn in to make a baby bonnet, which I'm so excited about. My friends, or also our friends, my friend Rebecca, our friends Rebecca and Sam are having a baby that's due in March. And I'm like, really want to start the bonnet now because I'm going to do it like freehand and just do quite chunky stripes. But that's not as urgent as Kev's hat. So I kind of won't, I know I shouldn't start the baby bonnet yet. But I want to because it's going to be so cute and little and also it's going to knit up pretty fast. But anyway, that's the knitting agenda. Reading wise, I've started and actually got quite a long way through a new audiobook. Oh, the lighting's so blue. Huh. Um, by Anthony Vesna So. So they wrote a book called After Parties. It's a collection of short stories about the Cambodian American experiences like first and second generation or post genocide from Cambodia moving to the US um, to like different parts of California. I love that short story collection so much published by one of my favorite publishers, Atlantic, and Anthony really tragically passed away, I think pretty soon after or before that collection, I think was published. Um, so his professor on his writing fellowship has re written a foreword for this new book called Songs on Endless Replete, Repeat, which is obviously being published posthumously. Um, and it's a collecting together all of the non-fiction work that he's written for places like The New Yorker and stuff. And then interspersed between that are chapters from his unfinished novel, um, Roots Through Cambo Town, I think it's called. Um, and it announces that the, it, obviously on audio you're listening, but it announced that the eight, each chapter, like the title, whether it's fiction or non-fiction and whether it's from the, the unfinished novel. But the unfinished novel chapters read sort of like a set of interconnected or repeating character short stories. They are so beautiful. And obviously it's so much more haunting to read this book knowing that Anthony's no longer with us and like that the book would never be finished. But it sometimes books that are published uh, posthumously do feel disjointed and sort of it's hard to find your footing with this but this just feels so beautiful his characterization his writing particularly in the novel reminds me and I know I think he was even friends with Brian Washington 
um, reminds me of that characterization and place particularly he writes about this enclave of houses where um, the characters are growing up and we are right now back in the yeah in their hometown because like a big matriarch of the community has passed away and we're talking about their funeral he takes a side tangent to talk about the history of Cambodian funerals and particularly the Cambodian American funeral experience post-genocide which again is haunting given the circumstances and you can watch clips on him of him on YouTube actually reading extracts of this book before obviously he passed away when he was a fellow and yeah I, I was touched by his story the first time I, I read the short story collection and found out about him passing so tragically at such a young age um and sort of has been following them if if this novel was going to be partially published and so to listen to it on audio so beautiful and the the foreword from his past professor professor as well is just yeah stunning so i really if you are going to read this i would really recommend reading his short story collection first to get more context and experience with his words and watching clips and interviews of him um from previous years but then yeah this feels like a really beautiful homage to him as a writer as a person to his Cambodian American experience and yeah it's just phenomenal so I'm really really enjoying that a great way to start my year um but when I finish with that I'm not sure what I'm going to pick up next I'm nothing I'm ready to finish wellness I've like sort of you know come to a bit of a impasse with it. I've got like 200 I think or maybe 100 and no more like 130 pages I think left and I, I'm quite ready to be done with it you know so and that's on me because I haven't read it for a few days and I feel like when I was in the rhythm of reading it more often then obviously you get through it quicker so I'm gonna do that this weekend hopefully if I can tear myself away from my knitting and yeah I'm excited for the weekend. <laughs> I don't think. Looking very ruddy. I just came back from being outside by myself, which feels good. I've been trying to do that a bit when I can and just like really focus on reclaiming a bit of my independence, I guess. It's hard. All I wish for is an electric wheelchair, but yeah, I managed to take a very slow walk to the pharmacy. I actually had to go out. I don't think I would have made the trip otherwise, but I like took the tram to the pharmacy and then walked home. If anyone stopped the bus. Had to collect a prescription and then on the way home had like a mooch on the high street you know do you ever just in the mood for like after work this little luck around got myself some pink tulips which is nice kind of disturbing that i don't think these surely aren't coming from holland because it feels like way too early in the year to be having tulips and they're a bit expensive for holland i think um I'm going through a real i mean i'm always going through a fizzy pop stage but i'm going through like a flavored sparkling water phase which I know is very big to all you Americans out there, but it's not so really that big. No, like it's just not as popular, I don't think. But I really like this one, Squeeze, the peach flavour. It is made where? I think in the Netherlands. But it's really good. And then I saw this cult 
water kefir ginger and lemon which also look nice then i went into cravat which is like kind of wilkinson's not as big but it's like a very chaotically organized boots but like a lot cheaper and like a bit more hectic no it's had like random food on sale it actually kind of gives pound that energy but it sells like medicine as well and i got 10 raspberry and raisin yeah. The Netherlands, one thing it does not do well is snack bars, like granola bars and stuff. You can buy the Grey's little flapjack ones, like fucking four euros. So we're on a budget and that's not going to happen. So yeah, I got 10 for three euros. Tom's doing a little gluten-free experiment at the moment for himself because he's really struggling with his digestion and stuff. So he can't eat those, so I bought him some other nut ones. Um, Take some of my prescription, did I say that? Yeah. And actually had a good medical interaction moment. I don't know if like, my old GP has left my surgery or if she just, I think she has because in the Netherlands, or this is my understanding at least that the GP surgeries are very small. They have like maybe four doctors or three doctors in the max and you like see the same one, like that's your doctor, which I feel like when I lived in Brighton and London, it's like you'll just see any doctor that's free because it's such a big rotation of patients. Anyway, my last GP, I really, she gassed at me so much. I really hated her and she was, we just didn't see eye to eye. She just would never really help me or take my concerns seriously. But anyway, I saw a new doctor today about like an issue I'm having with my sinuses, which I don't think is related to any of my other conditions. But when she was looking through my notes and I was explaining my symptoms, she was like, oh, and like, how is your pain? How is your this? How is your that? Like, obviously looking to see about my whole history, which I thought was quite nice, never really had that experience before so maybe the bar is low but that was a nice interaction anyway you came here for books and knitting can i show you my knitting i think i can so i'm knitting something for my friend rebecca and her husband sam they're having a baby rebecca does know this channel exists but i don't think she watches it she's a busy woman but anyway i'm making a bonnet and it's blue and green stripes and it's gonna be so cute and also i when i ordered this yarn online i thought the kelly green was gonna be a lot brighter but it's actually not as bright as i thought it was gonna be but i think it's really cute we're going for a genderless look as well because they've chosen either not to reveal or like not to find out about the sex of their baby which is totally cool so i just thought this would look so cute i've actually realized i've pulled a couple of these stitches while it's been in my bag which is kind of annoying but I think it's gonna be really cute and now I kind of want to make one in my size I'm having a whole mail of my balaclava don't even talk to me about it oh that's the other thing to talk to you guys about isn't it that I went to the knitting stuff at the weekend so I went to that knitting club it was nice I felt quite old like there was a lot of TikTok and Taylor Swift chat which made me feel quite old and I think I am maybe one of the oldest people there Actually, no, that's not true. But a lot, it's like people just felt like, yeah, lots of them still students and like different pop culture references, different vibe. But it was like actually just so nice to knit in community with other people. And there I met another British girl, like a girl from Yorkshire, who was really nice. And we got to chatting and then we went out for coffee yesterday because she like teaches yoga at a studio that's near my house, even though she doesn't really live around here. Um, and she was lovely and that was 10 out of 10 and we're gonna like do more low-key knitting dates which i think it's really nice to find people to craft with um so that was good so it was worth going just to like meet her i guess it was cool i think i probably will go again it's like the first sunday of the month i think or every other i can't remember it only happens once a month but yeah i wouldn't say it was i just think the older i get the less i'm into like big group meetups anyway that was probably like 14 people there which is quite a lot to interact with and it is just sort of like luck of where you end who you end up sitting next to you know what I mean because you're not really going to talk as one big group um I enjoyed the community aspect of the knitting although I would say there was only like three knitters and everyone else was a crochet and I don't really vibe with crochet style of stuff like it's not really my taste or aesthetic so like also that wasn't that helpful to me in terms of like getting help and inspiration and stuff but the one girl the other 
British guy I met, she is a knitter and like a fucking sick knitter, so she's a good person to know because she can help me hopefully with my balaclava. <laughs> um, so that was knitting. I'm also going on another knitting day on Saturday this weekend, um, which will be fun. And yeah, it's good. It's good. We're getting there. We're doing stuff. We're making it through. Um, reading. I finished wellness. I'm not going to chat about it because I feel like I chat, chatted about it loads in the last video. So I think I'll just wait till the wrap up. But it was a bit of a slog at the end, but we got there. I've just started Wet Paint by Chloe Ashby, which I've been meaning to read for ages. I follow Chloe on Instagram and she has a background in sort of art history. And she, like, a lot of her journalism ro rotates around art. Um, and this is her novel. I think she has a second novel out now by the time like since this has come out and I haven't read it, but my one of my friends here lent this to me. Another new friend I've made, oh, bloody hell, can't keep track, no. Um, she's like a friend of a friend who is a big reader, so we met out for coffee and did a book exchange, and this is what she lent me. I lent her Gwendolyn Riley's First Love, and then I've just lent her Carla, because Gwendolyn Riley's so short. But um, it's about two girls, Grace and Eve, and Grace passes away at university, we're not sure how, I think it's, I'm pretty sure it's suicide and we're following Eve as she's like post-university trying to muddle through this grief and understand losing your best friend it's fucking sad if I'm honest she's just like been assaulted at work um she works in like a St John's the Ivy Common Garden type restaurant you know super bougie um traditional stuffy ruddy gammon men touching your legs vibe She's just walked out of that job and she's talking about how she finds it hard to hold down a job, obviously probably as a result of, or at least in part due to her unprocessed trauma of your best friend dying, which is fucking tragic. So that's what I'm reading. I just started it this morning. And then I'm listening to a new audio book. I finished Impossible City as well. You'll see that on a wrap up. And now I'm listening to My Padre. Padre should be said in an Irish accent because this is a book about a priest who fell in with the IRA and became essentially a gun runner like was working he was like a, he's a lone person but basically is the go-between between Gaddafi and the Libyan army and the IRA all throughout the troubles so we watch him from childhood find out about his family history how he became a priest why he became a priest, really interesting about the like exploitation of Catholicism following the Irish immigration, like uh, migration out of Ireland post um, like different points in the 20th century and their ties to different African nations and lib uh, like liberation groups. And we're now our friend, father, what's his name? I can't remember, Padre, <laughs> they often call him that, is in, Rome, like in Italy, driving around the campfire collecting money, sending arms. So we're finding out about all the different ways that the IRA essentially skirted international law to fund their attacks. Um, the author is a journalist, and I, and I think from this, what it, she's made it sound like, at least at the start, that she's she met the priest in his old age and has interviewed him for this story. So it's a lot of his, which you do find is fa not fairly common, but like there is a few in um, Patrick Radding Keys, of course, in Say Nothing, he gets a lot of first-hand accounts from people who committed crimes and sort of were responsible for some really awful stuff in the Troubles, but as old men retired in random Irish villages are now able to speak on it. Um, but it's really interesting, obviously, the religious aspect of this as well, and him sort of moralising his situation and deciding the ethics on what he was doing, basically. So, yeah, it's a real fascinating listen. It's on Everand, um, so if you have a membership, you can just listen for free. And it's definitely kept me going while I've had a really busy and stressful work week. So it's been good when I was doing, like, mindless admin and stuff, and I'm going to listen to it a bit now. Tom's working late again, uh, like out of the out of the office. So I'm gonna put my headphones on, turn the lights off, <laughs> and light some candles and do some knitting and put my flowers away. And yeah, I'll probably catch up with you back on the weekend when I've read a bit more of wet paint.
Valentine's Day. I don't know, these vlogs seem to now be less weekly and more so. I film them over like two weeks or ten days. It's Wednesday, I'm not working today and I'm resting because I feel like I've been hit by a bus. So I did get out of bed and wash my hair but then I got back into bed and now it's the afternoon. But I wanted to catch you up and probably wrap this up. I finished, well firstly I finished knitting my balaclava with my nice eye cord and I mean the top it could have been better I basically freehanded this I started following a pattern and then realized I didn't like the pattern it was basically two rectangles and had a square so then I started decreasing and then I had to unravel it but then I'm my friend helped me do the decreases at the top but it's still I don't know, it looks a little messy, but you're not going to see that bit because it's going to be on my head and it's so warm, which of course I finished this literally as we finished having a snowstorm, so it's actually a little too warm. This is made with two two strands of Drops Air, which is like a blown alpaca yarn, and it's, yeah, so cosy, and it's more of like a, it's like more of like a hood shape, which is what I wanted. I wish now I had made the ribbing a little longer, I just haven't blocked it. But yeah, I think it looks pretty cool and it's so cosy and I didn't really want it like that because that's not really my style. So even though it is a balaclava, it's more like a hood. But yeah, I'm really happy with it. And then I cast on the two-tone green hat I was talking about for my friend Kev. Um, it's not like my personal colour palette, but I know he's gonna love it. Also, I painted my nails for the first time in ages and I can't tell if they look like sick or not. But maybe they're cute. Who knows? Sometimes when you haven't had your nails done for a while, any colour on them looks kind of weird. But I just wanted to get back into it, doing my gel at home, I mean. Um, this is the Rose Knitwear Esker hat, which is like a slip stitch. I don't know if this is technically brioche or not, but... It makes the squishiest fabric ever and it's in these two colours of green which are both just hunched on wool by drops. This one up close has like, he requested like tweedy speckles. So this one is like a two-tone and then this one has actually quite interestingly like really quite bright blue speckling in it. And I think he's going to love it. So that's that. Reading wise, I finished what well, audiobooks? I finished The Padre and I finished Songs on Endless Repeat. Songs of Endless Repeat was stunning, 10 out of 10. Can't recommend it more. Just make sure you read the short story collection first, I think, to fully understand the author's experiences and sort of get to grips with their tonality and character choices. But yeah, can't recommend that enough. Um, I finished the Padre, that was dark, really dark, as you can expect, obviously, from the synopsis, but um, really well narrated. Um, at the end, I think I said I wasn't sure about like the Belfast Agreement and, and how he was able to speak so freely about what happened to him. So he actually was arrested a couple of times in Belgium and the UK tried to, or um, England tried to extradite him on sort of being an accomplement, no, accomplice to terror because of the arms he was buying, but that didn't, um, that didn't work. He was repatriated to Ireland and never prosecuted. And that was like, he, they talk about the media coverage of that and sort of the blowback from the church and like losing his priesthood and he talks and basically says like he doesn't regret it even though he's responsible I think they said like one of the most deadly technically one of the most deadly people in the troubles because of and like the sheer number of arms he helped provide and, and fun financial aid as well that he collected but there was no remorse and no sort of yeah I don't know it was just really dark at the end because he, he basically says like my only regret is not killing more people which I guess, yeah, it's a very complicated conflict with a lot of different moving parts to it, but to wish you, like, harmed more is just kind of wild to think about. Um, 
but yeah i think i was actually chatting to my friend who i'm making the hat for about it because um we were talking about one of the like that appears as almost like a side character in this book about this guy who like pretends to be the like a representative for like irish beef farmers but that's like his front while he's in libya trying to schmooze Gaddafi and yeah that, that was so well like there's so many sprinklings of stories in there that like I would read individual oh sorry I'm shaking you balancing on my um water bottle that I would read individual stories from but uh, I would really recommend it it's a great audio listen in terms of I often get asked when I talk about books about the troubles like how much you need to know before you read them each one I would say this one definitely requires context because this is an individual story as opposed to an overview of the situation it doesn't really talk about combat in terms of like the different sects and why things were happening it talks obviously about like Maggie Thatcher and that Brighton incident and his role he played in you know partially he basically invented one of the timers that allowed the IRA to um, create long lead times on their explosives, which obviously then, you know, incited more violence. So he talks about that. And so, yeah, I guess you do definitely need context, watch a documentary or two before you read it, but this is a very accessible way to understand just one part of it in particular like the financial wing of that war and how yeah how the troubles were funded and what each person the internal politics i guess partially of the group so i really enjoyed that and now i'm listening to carolina donahue's promising young women not related to Emerald Fennell's Promising Young Women, the film, which we also watched Soul Burn at the weekend, which I'm not going to talk about because Tom and I went on a 40 minute rant about it on our Patreon podcast that we post once a month. So you can head over there if you want to hear us complain about how terrible that film was. Um, but Promising Young Women by Carolina Donahue, who wrote The Rachel Incident and Scenes of a Graphic Nature. This is, it's fine. It's nowhere near as good as The Rachel Incident. It, and it's definitely my third favorite. But it's an all right listen. It's about like a girl working in an ad agency having an affair with her boss. And it has almost quite like a Dolly Alderton air to it. I know they're friends, but there's a like agony arm part of this book that sounds like Dear Dolly. So yeah, I guess that's kind of interesting. Um, and then I finished Wet Paint. I was not prepared for how brutal this book is. Like huge content warning for sexual violence, for... Um, yeah, yeah, I was just telling Tom about it, and I, is this a trauma plot book? Like, maybe. So we follow Eve and Grace, like I explained before, and um, Grace, Eve is still reeling from the death of her friend, and she feels partially responsible for her suicide, which they get into. Throughout the book, it's interspersed with these italic paragraphs and sentences, which is Grace talking, no, Eve talking to Grace um and trying to process what's happened and giving us memories of them at oxford together and that goes in sort of like reverse chronological order until we at the end of the book find out why she took her own life um but yeah there's a lot in it there's, it's very traumatic so she starts she loses her job like i said and then she moves in with her that is quite a nice and like um her like main romance which is like a childhood or like teenage on and off love that she's had who's just so supportive and so it's just like it becomes such a soft place to land for her as she really just continually fucks up and finds herself in these self-destructive cycles but max her uh like the love interest is so yeah he's he's a good lad he's there he's there he's there through the tough times the um Eve's dad is like an alcoholic drinking himself to death in his flat and that that stuff is all so visceral and tragic and heartbreaking and a little too close to home for me personally and I found that really really hard to read like I wanted to finish this book because I just wanted it to be over because I found it all so like so much and I don't know if that is just where I'm at right now or if I would have found that at a different time but it was just like deeply sad and the sexual violence especially that um eve faced like in her 
in her 20s when she's trying to recover from the grief of losing her best friend is just so yeah so intense and it does all tie up neatly in the end which is a bit strange but not strange but like if it, it she does get help you know but I think it just felt so untethered and so just constant barrage of awful things it was quite intense and it, it's quite a short book like it reads quite fast but I think I read it in like three or four sittings maybe because I just wanted like either had to catch a break and then every time she didn't catch a break I was like I just want to finish this book so I don't know if I'd recommend it like I just found it a bit in too intense for me personally but obviously intensity and content warnings and all of that is so personal to the reader and sort of what you've experienced and what you've been through and what you think is feels like something you can read about so yeah I would definitely go into this one with like all of that in your mind because I feel like it could be quite a lot for quite a lot of people but yeah I'm glad I've read it now because it has been I have been wanting to read it for a while I think this afternoon I'll pick up a new book and that'll probably be in the next vlog you see so thank you guys so much for watching I appreciate all of your lovely comments and let me know if you've read Wet Paint or if you're going to pick up any of these other books I mentioned particularly if you're going to read After Parties and Songs on Endless Repeat I'd love to hear that that would be music to my ears and I'll see you all in the next one bye